David Webb, welcome to the podcast. Brilliant to see you. Thank you for your time, especially as you're recovering, as you say, from the dreaded man flu. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I've had it for the last few days, so hopefully over the worst of it now. Good man, good man. And and just tell us about yourself a little bit, your journey as well to where <clears throat> you are today, because looking particularly on your LinkedIn page, it's a rich history in football over, over two decades of coaching yeah. and, and development, but also like your, I guess, move, gradual progression from more of the technical side of football to the psychological. Yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting journey. So um, I started probably in football professionally with the academies with the old Wimbledon back in two thousand and one. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show me age a little bit now. <laughs> big big time that was it. That was the sort of the end of an era. Yeah, it was actually. It was it was literally the last sort of couple of seasons before they, you know, unfortunately sort of folded and regrouped and ventured off so yeah no it was um that was good times and then straight from there I went to Crystal Palace Academy and uh, to continue my coaching journey and I was there for three years and I sort of got into recruitment as well as academy coaching with um sort of the under 10 under 11 to got into recruitment as well and was lucky enough to come across a player that we might have heard of in Zaha now oh yeah really what what was yeah. that like what, what was he like as a kid yeah he very it was quite strange how I come across him because he was he was um, playing for sort of a local team called White Horse Rondos, the same team as my little cousin. And he sort of flagged him to me and said, "Be you know, come and watch this. Come and we got this striker. Come and watch him." And he was incredibly warm, but quick. Scored lots of goals. So we brought him in for back then it was like a six week trial for the Palace Academy. He was coming into the under elevens, I think, and he'd been training for sort of three or four weeks. Hadn't really played any games because he was quite raw. He was a bit unpolished for the structural type academy training. So what happened then is the coach said to me, he said, I'm not sure. And I said, have you played him yet? And he went, no. I said, we've got to play him in the game. I said, because we've only got a couple of more weeks, you know, to sort of make a, you know, make a call on him. And he said, right, okay. And then he phoned me after, I think it was a Tottenham <laughs> Academy game. And he phoned me, he said, we're signing him. I said, play well, did he? And he said, yeah, we won 6-3 six, six, or 6-4 six, and he scored all of them. I said, wow. right, okay. Is that, is that so, sometimes a problem that we talk about technique and, and patterns of play and stuff? Do we overthink it sometimes, the actual the impact players can have? Yeah, I think so. And I think especially at those young, young ages as well, it's because he was so raw. He's never been into sort of academy system where, you know, the coaching is quite polished and quite structured. So, and, and his background had just been played. You know, mm. just get on the pitch, score goals, try and beat players one v ones. So, and and again, you want him to be a part of that system. But I think you've got to make sort of real allowances for a player of that talent to come in and give him time to develop. Because in games, is really, really he's going to come alive. You know, because he's coming into a professional system that he's never played before, and obviously, he's, you know, he's impacting straight away. So I think with those sorts of players that come from sort of like raw backgrounds, you, you've got to give them time to develop. You've did got to give that, them time to get into the system. I'll let you continue your journey in, in just a second, but I wonder if it, yeah. if this connects, because did that sow a seed with you about the tension between the, <clears throat> the collective and the individual and the, and the fear sometimes that some of the individual brilliance and creativity can be coached out of people. We're looking at, a man in Gareth Southgate, who a lot of people <clears throat> are sort of doing their pop psychology and thinking he's got a lot of anxiety around Maverick style players and, and, and whether the Grealishes and Foden's would ever start for him, which seems ridiculous given they're playing for the best club side in the world. But perhaps absolutely, in, yeah. in, internally, his psychology isn't comfortable with people who are unpredictable. And you think we need that unpredictability to an extent, don't we, in, in a team game like football? Oh, absolutely. Because... Um... You know, that these players are quite what I call we mentioned Foden and Grealish there, and, and Wilfie's in that category as well, where they can turn a game on its head, especially at the top level. We're talking Premier League and international level. So, I think, I think sometimes what happens is, is when you're in a team structure like football, there's so many elements they want to cover the grounds of, you know, when out of possession, is he pressing? Is he not doing? Is he doing this? Is he doing that? Um, but for me, as long as you get some basic elements into him, so he's part of that team structure, when he's on the ball or when he makes those runs off the ball, these players, they're electric. So there is probably a, a bit of cautious around them. But mm. my my approach, my approach would be um, is you have to have them in your team. But obviously, you want them to function as part of your team. I think that's, that's key. 
but you obviously want them to do what they can do with their individual brilliance and turn games on their heads and, you know, light up the stage. Because I think, especially in these games where they're so tight, these, these players really make a difference. So it's almost a switch, is it, between having possession and not having possession? You want them to be functional out of possession, but then when they have the ball, yeah. to be, be free and expressive. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because especially especially the way the modern teams play, the modern teams, it's a lot of it's a running game. So a lot of teams sort of press, but they press high, they press low, press in the middle. So you, you want you want um, your team to function in, in that manner where, you know, they are doing their work sort of off the ball. But you, you're only doing that work so you can recycle the ball back quickly so you can go forward. So then that's when you're attacking players, but then you want them to come alive. So it's regaining the ball as quickly as possible. So you need the team to do that. But then these, these top players, you want them on the ball in the attacking areas because they can really change games. Yeah, he's been such a player and such a servant to, to Crystal Palace in, in two spells as well. How rewarding is that when you see players develop like that, that you had a, a hand in, in their journey? Yeah, it's very rewarding because he, you know, it wasn't easy for him on his journey through the academy system because of that, um, where his background was from, being that raw talent. So coming into a structured coaching programme, you know, it was a challenge for him even as he got older. And I think even until he was sort of broke through in the first team, 17, 18, he was still mm. not knowing which way his future may go. Um, wow. And then he had a couple of outstanding games in the FA Youth Cup and uh, he was brought into first team training the next morning and, and that was it, the rest was history. So it's, sometimes it's it's the right opportunities, right times that can that can give these little players a platform because Eddie Allen maybe had a couple of good games for Palace at that good time his journey could have been completely different. So, yeah, I think you have to be patient with them. You have to know what their strengths are. You know they're going to be game changers and you've got to appreciate that talent because football is you need individual brilliance sometimes just to just to score or unlock defences when the games are so tight and these players, you know, they really do come into their own when there's yeah, no situations. And they're often the players that make kids fall in love with the game in the, in the first place and the whole... Absolutely. The whole show keep keep on the road to a certain extent. What So where did you go from that that point then? Where was the, the journey? Because it involves some big clubs. Yeah, so my first stint at Tottenham after Palace, I was recruited um, into Tottenham's Academy in 2005. And again, that was academy coaching roles, probably some of the more older age groups. And and it was kind of recruitment as well, because I, I recommended quite a few players to Palace that, that did really well. And I had a good knowledge of sort of the South London and London areas, yeah. or sort of like the street players or all players. So Tottenham wanted to really tap into that, but also continue with the coaching. So I had two, three years there, which was, you know, which was phenomenal. And then I was Martin um, Yole was the head coach. Did you to work with Yole at all at that point? Yeah, yeah. Martin was there. Martin was the Martin was the head coach. And at the time, there was you know there was a lot of good good idols like Edgar Davids was there at the time. Yeah. Robbie Keane. There was some really good. But some Berbatov, really good players. Yeah. yeah. Berbatov, and I, I think one day the story was, um, and it was a really good eye opener. Once we took the under 16s to watch Edgar Davids because we took him in early because he would arrive before training. And he would want to get over two thousand ball touches before training wow. had actually started. He was, and he said, "I have to have the feel of the ball." He said, "You know," and this is what I, I've always done as a young player before training. I get here, and he just has loads and loads of different touches, different turns, different techniques, and he does it at tempo. and And it was an eye opener for sort of the mm. under four, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen to watch at this time because you're watching a top class international player. And still, probably was in his 30, 31. So maybe not as he peaked, but still a quality player. But still has that mentality to his mindset is to come in, and this is yeah. what I need to do every day. It's not, it's not, yeah, it's not an accident that you get that good. There's, you know, even people that make no. it look effortless, there's, there's a lot of effort that's gone into it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. He had that top class, like top class mindset to be, you know, to be still continue his career at that level, and he knew what he had to do. And I think if you get into those good habits early as young players, it certainly sort of catches the eye if you're looking to catch the eye of coaches, if you want to do them extras or you want to do that little bit more, you know, beyond training, whatever position you are, if you want to do extra training, if you're a striker, more shooting and finishing, more defending training, whichever position you are. I think sometimes coaches always at that young age want to do more with you. 
So it's always a good it's always a good sort of learning block as well. And you get to see the mentality of young players as well within that as well. Yeah, you I said that's ones to... that re- really do want it. I said that to actually journalists, a lot of aspiring presenters and people like that, and say, look, if there's an auto queue where you are that you can go and read, just get the reps in. I think you can apply that principle to a lot of industries absolutely across life. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think yes, um, that, that was a good sort of like learning block for the players there coming through at that time, because even that time you had Harry Kane coming through. Oh yeah. So he was, you know, he was the young academy product and sort of Ryan Mason and, you know, Andres Townsend. Yeah. So these players also went on to have very good careers. So they were, they was watching this firsthand. They sort of those, you know, Hopefully, well, definitely Harry Kane. He took it on now to become yeah. where he is. So it really reminds me. It reminds me of Eric Cantona in the um, the class of '92 and the impact he apparently had on them in terms of his dedication to training, the extra time yeah. he put in with set pieces and ball striking and things. So that, that it that's does powerful. It does. It, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. Um, I think after Tottenham, I made a switch back down to sort of South London. Was like a head of academy coaching role to Millwall. Yeah. Um, more of a sort of like a like a management type role, if you like, working with um, sort of younger players on coaching and recruitment. Um, and that was a sort of full-time position, which lasted sort of two, three years. That unfortunately came to an end when they lost their academy status. I went to a centre of excellence status and there was sort of a few sort of cuts that had to be made. And then Millwall lost their sort of divisional status from sort of champ to league one as well. But I was doing my academy license at that time, the old academy manager's license, and I managed to get abroad and do a study at Bayer Leverkusen. Mm. Um, oh, just cool. to, yeah, it was it was phenomenal for me at that time because I was doing that, and then I did a masters. I was doing a masters at the time. I already got my A license, so there was a lot going on, and I was in the in that learning phase, um, young, hungry learning phase, and. Bayer Bayer was a great, um, great learning because I only went there to do a study, but I ended up continuing doing some consulting work after for them Mm. um, because I was quite fascinated with my views of how sort of I was fascinated with the characteristic side of players. Yeah. So beyond beyond the technical, tactical and the physical attributes, the character side of um, like in games and profiling them and how to look beyond the player, where they come from, their environment. And they said, we've never seen this before, especially I don't know if they was being biased towards their own country or they didn't believe in the English. They said, you're not, you, you, we wouldn't call you a typical English in your <laughs> well, they approach. Thought they, they thought you were too nuanced, did they? Too, too textured. Yeah. Yeah. There's maybe it was in the area where it was four, four, two and a bit more direct. <laughs> so that was a, that was an amazing experience because you got to see, you know, firsthand that the German structure coming to its age. Cause that was in 2009, 10 where you had the golden generations like us all coming through. And they was really investing mm. in sort of the federational side. They was winning sort of worlds under 17s, under 19s. They, they were doing that domination era. So it was really fast. Yeah. And the clubs were all on board with the German Federation at that time. So it was really interesting to see how they were, um, how they were set up um, for pathways for players to come through, through that what, system. What, what sort of, I guess, grains of sand were coming together in your mind about the psychological makeup of, of the players who were making it and the <clears> environments <throat> that yielded it. Cause there's always a nature nurture debate, isn't there? Is this something yeah, that, there like, is. The, the clubs could foster a good psychology in the players? Or are you looking for players with the right psychology? What were the thought, what were your thoughts when you were at Leverkusen? Is, I guess this picture started to come into shape for you. Yeah, it, it did really, it really got to, it, I suppose I got to see, um, you, you get to see sort of different parts in, in the game, obviously their work effort and what they do off the ball. But then once you once these sort of little elements of stuff like this catches your eye, then then for me you start to delve a little bit deeper. Once you do that, I like to look at sort of their playing history and then consistency patterns beyond that as well. So if they've had consistency patterns, which would mean which would indicate to me more commitment rather than sort of temporary motivation. So that means they're consistently committed to doing what they're doing on that basis. Then you look at their education. You can look at their educational background of sort of how they developed and how they functioned. And then I kind of see it as like environmental matches. So what they're coming out of and what you're bringing them into, because sometimes when you've got raw talent, as we've seen with um, even at the top levels with De Bruyne and Salah when they've been at Chelsea, they're extremely talented players. But mm. the environments and the culture just wasn't right for them at that time. Doesn't mean they're still not good, extremely talented football players. So I. Uh, these sort of little things started to really um, sort of materialise in my mind because I was thinking, 
there is there's so much talent out there, but why are some players performing at this club and not performing at this club? I'm doing here. So I think looking into the background and starting to profile them and look to see where, you know, some of their characteristic traits, some of their backgrounds is could could fit into the clubs that I was working for at the time. I think that becomes sort of a key element because the football side should become an automatic if you're a professional at that level. You should know the technical, tactical, physical attributes you're looking at. That's mm. a given. But then the the detail of the other side, you know, these these are really sort of what I call tipping the balance in your favour because there's no guarantee when you're trying to sign players anyway that they, they're going to work. But the more information you had, the more that you understood about them and their background and understood about your own club and what that was offering. You're trying to marry, you know, the two together as much as you can. So you've got that, you've got that mix. Are are psychological habits or or traits, are they coachable in football clubs? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think if they've got the raw ingredients that all everyone, you know, uses these words of hard work, desire, determination, for me, they should be given in football players anyway. So, what you're looking for is is players that can go beyond the call of duty that they're willing to do, like we discussed earlier. The extras is how they can potentially handle themselves around a dressing room, which is again, I think, is so undervalued that camaraderie and that team spirit in in the personalities in the dressing room. So you're looking for all these little elements within that as well. Like Poch was very good at um, at Tottenham when I was there the second time of bringing this yeah. out of. He wanted players that he could, you know, he says they have to be good for the dressing room. They have to be good for the dressing room. He said, because then, you know, there's, their their character will complement his character and his character and his character. He said, so these elements are, are really important. So, yes, they are coachable um, within that as well. I think if within the environment you're in, you don't want to go sort of too deep in terms of, you know, giving them sort of pro psychological profiles and stuff, but you want to give them, it's like an adaptation into your environment. Mm. So you're helping them adapt more than becoming saying, right, you have to work on this as your character. It's more like adaptable traits. How, how do you present and frame the tension with, with the individual aspiration and the team collective? Is it that you, you forge the two together and say, ultimately, and I think even Julius Caesar, I was looking at Roman history, he was yeah. very big on g- gifting all the soldiers, uh, treating them very well, treating the, the superiors well. Yeah. As, he, as he worked his way up the ladder in Roman society, he always gave his money away, gifted. He was very conscious of how his star would rise if other people were happy with him. Is that something that you yeah. express to the players? If if you help your left back, if you're the left winger, it'll like, reflect well on you, et cetera, et cetera. Because there's often a, a competitive, there's a competitive element in it as well, isn't there? And I think in all workplaces, you have that competitive element where you're working as yeah, a team, but, but you're all trying to get up the ladder as well. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think competitive environments in all sports, you know, I've, I've read a lot in all sports that if you can create a competitive framework within your training structures, um, it, it's very healthy because when you come to play match days, ultimately, you you know, you're going to be competing against your position. But yeah, if the, the framework you set for your team is, if it's just a sort of cliche, like you say, with Julius Julie Caesar approach, I think, as a coach, you're saying, well, well, best to the players, how best can I serve you, you know, mm. during this? How how best can I serve you as a coach? You know, what what qualities do I need for this particular group? Um, and then you're looking at sort of blending characters of how how the team can complement each other as well. So, again, yeah, it, it does become like a serving. Like we're all trying to serve each other and help each other ha- in, in that way, but also trying to keep that competitive spirit as well. If training is competitive, how important is it for players that it that it's perceived as a, met- a meritocracy that no one's a, a given starter in the team? Have you looked into that at all? Yeah, absolutely. And I think in, I was having this conversation the other day actually about the metrics of players not starting and, and starting. And I think when you've got this competitive side, it will, it will ultimately bring out more in players during training. Because they know they know they have to compete, they have to show up, they have to be prepared, and they have to be fully ready to go in training every day. Because this is the environment and the framework you're seeing. And I think when it comes to the players that are not within your, um, and they're not going to be in your starting eleven. Say, uh, I think the, the best way to do it is if if you have in in your systems again, if you if everything is if you have the facility so it's filmed and it's graded, and you understand them as people that you can 
as long as they feel that they're going to be part of the action at some point during the game, yeah. and they're going to be part of maybe, if not that game, then the next game. It's just to keep them fully involved and make them feel valued in that process as well, that ultimately you might not be starting through this game through this reasons because we need we need to affect the game more in these areas and we feel that your qualities are better served maybe in this game or coming on at a later stage. And I think if you can explain it and have, if you've got a relationship with the players, you can have those honest conversations then show them by performance rather than... So you have the conversation as one, then you're going to show them some performance patterns as two. Players, ultimately, they want to play. So even though, even at that, if you give them all that information, they still might not like it. But I think at least if they see something visible, tangible, then they and then they can say, "Well, you've been fair with me. I understand yeah. this, and, it, and I'll be ready to go." It's it's a complicated process, and I have sympathy when I look at it from a coach's yeah. perspective because right now people will be saying. Uh, Callum Wilson looks more likely to score a goal for England than Harry Kane, who may not be fit. Yeah. But but Kane has got a decade of of, cre- of bank of credited back stuff in the in the bank with Gareth Southgate yeah. and at, at club level as well. So when he's out of form, he'll still get picked. But that's very challenging for the the understudy at clubs, isn't it? When you've got a sort of a superstar, we've seen it with, with Cristiano Ronaldo as well, as he's yeah. got a little bit older and and not starting games, that becomes more difficult. It's it's a tricky one, isn't it? If you're uh, if you're up against someone who's got that sort of legacy achievement, yeah, it is. It is, <clears throat> and I think sometimes it's with someone like Harry Kane. He's because of his record, and even though he hasn't scored, you know, the first couple of games, I think he's. Callum Wilson going in, looking into it. I know Callum very well from Bournemouth. Mm. So, oh, yeah. Uh, I know he's, it was, we signed him. You know, we signed him when I was at Bournemouth's head of recruitment. So we did a lot of work on Callum. So we know sort of intimately about his attributes and what he can bring to a team. I think sometimes with, when you're looking at England, Harry Kane, if you've got pace around him, like he's in the previous two games, Sterling and Saka, if he drops that little bit deeper, like he plays for Song, he can also play you know, clever passes in behind. He can mm. turn and spin and play players in. And I think with Callum, you'd probably have to play different players around him too because yeah. he's more likely to stretch the play in behind. He's more lively in the box. He's, he offers a completely different... Maybe a Madison or someone behind him if Madison's fit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you'd have to sort of, you know, because I think players complement players. Like Harry Kane would definitely, you know, you see it in the game against around the... Saka and um, especially Stern in the, in the midfield runners, even Benningham running in, they benefit from his movement, the way that he can, mm. you know, let those players get into those spaces when he does drop deep. Also, you also know he's a goal threat. So I think you have to weigh up the opposition and weigh up what, what you're looking at and weigh up where you are in the situation. I think sometimes leaving Harry Kane out, he's, he's damned if you do, damned if you don't, because if you... If, if, if yeah. Callum, say, come in and doesn't score, then they say, well, why'd you drop Harry? And if Harry doesn't score, it's like, well, why'd you not put in Callum? So it's a it's a damn situation with either way you go. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating as well. And as you went to Bournemouth, and that was an interesting year, wasn't it? Eddie Howe as, as Bournemouth yeah. rose up. How how exciting was was that to be to be part of that? And I suppose you're talking about the profile and scrutiny on Gareth Southgate. I guess the, the profile and scrutiny of Bournemouth rose incredibly because for a lot of us, not long ago, they were a League One club and suddenly they became an established Premier League side. Yeah, it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable. Um, I was recruited when uh, to be sort of head of recruitment and analysis from Southampton in 2013 when Bournemouth had just come from League One into the champ. So expectations was just to consolidate in the league, really, and just to sort of get the feel of the league and maintain that. There was a bit of a transition higher up where uh, new ownership was coming in. Um, with sort of Max Denham, the Russian owner who's just recently sold. Mm. So, um, but that didn't necessarily mean we had an increased budget. We still was our budget was probably half, maybe sort of the lower end of that. And it was quite good. This is when you really I learned about sort of really being aligned with all your departments, especially with the first team of how you're going to operate and how effective real recruitment can be. So having that close relationship with, with Ed and the first team staff to understand his playing style and his philosophy. And he's very big on sort of the character and the psychology side of how he likes to operate. Yeah. And he's not, and he's, and he's, he's quite cautious on players. So to get, to get a player to his attention, a lot of work had to be done. Um, obviously we were well organized to know the positions and stuff we'd have to do um, in advance. But when we started presenting profiles of players, 
then you know we knew the framework of 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 what we had to do because the detail had to be sort of on point of what, of what we're looking at. And again, the character side came into it because he believed the dressing room was sacred. So, Bournemouth being a family club, um, being where it was, you know, there was a lot of things we had to take into consideration before we was before we even presented players to sign. But the phenomenal rise was because. The, the club was aligned and Ed and his team were a massive part of that, you know, that included everyone. It was a family club. Everyone felt part of the journey. They felt part of the story. Um, the recruitment team that we had was pretty small as well. So was the analysis team. Elder departments were really small, but I think in a way that helped us mm. because it helped us all pull together and we had that sort of good trust in each other's work. You know, my job was, you know, quite pivotal because it was, the recruitment of players that could, you know, work within Eddie's style of play. And so he could get the best out of them. And, you know, our recruitment, I think, during that period was 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 really good. We got a lot, we got a lot more right than we got wrong. So yeah. Callum being part of that, Dan Gosling, we got free, Adam Smith, we got free, Josh King was free, the sermon was free. You know, there was a, there was loads of junior status class was free. There was loads of really good players that we could that we understood that we could get um, at cost. Callum was the only one we paid money for, so it was, it was about two point three, two point four. But that was sort of supplemented because we sold Lewis Graben. So was Callum was, was Callum from Coventry? Was that yeah, 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 yeah? And he and that was really his first season, Callum, of um, being on the map, if you like, at Coventry in League One because he was playing with uh, Leon Clark up front at the time and the season before he'd been more like a winger but we needed that sort of pace that pace and power that he could bring into it so again a lot of work was done on Callum to um, before we presented him and we was you know we was lucky to get him but the success uh, I think the success is was all about the team harmony and the alignment of the club at the time but but how much was it about destroying players' own beliefs about their level because people from the externally will say that's a League One player, that's a Championship player, that's a Premier League player. Yeah. There were players who've been in the League One who would have been identified as League One players who are suddenly playing in the Premier League, but actually adapting to it. What was Eddie Howe's secret in terms of developing confidence and belief? Because people now point to the money at Newcastle, don't they? But what they don't think is, how come Joe Linton is playing as good as he was before how come yeah Miguel Almiron is suddenly looking like Lionel Messi when he didn't look like he could hit a barn door before yeah exactly it, it, it's amazing the change isn't it it is yeah and this is when we talk about an understanding the environment so the environment wanted to create a, a Bournemouth it was a very sort of close environment and I say Ed is like a teacher the way he sort of teaches in players and and in a way he He's got many faces to his coaching. He's a very detailed and methodical coach. He's excellent on the grass um, of working with players day in, day out. But he's also very good you know, on one-to-ones and getting to know his players and understand them, giving them confidence and, and belief. So if he thinks players can play within his system of play, he you know, he really does develop them and believe in them to, to go on and push beyond their limits, where you see, like you say, even a Bournemouth um some of these players playing for different clubs might not have got a second look. But playing under that structure in that environment, under that system of play, they look completely different. And again, it's down to the coaching team and the confidence, the belief, and sort of the teaching they give them to go on and execute that on the pitch. I think that's good for any walk of life, isn't it? To know that confidence and belief can be instilled in us, in other Absol- people. Because abs- I think a lot absolutely. of times you, you think it's set in stone, don't you? But you can you can pull things out of people. Yeah, you can. And this is where, and this is where I think some of the top managers, you know, really come into their own. Potter was masterclass. Ed was very good, as well. I probably two of the best I've seen that of getting the best out of people and having real. It's not, I'd say, like an authentic belief. It wasn't, mm. you know. So players are more smart than people think, and you know they can see through that. But I think a real authentic belief where, you know. You, the players will think, right, he really does believe in me. He really can take my game to another level. So, you know, I know I've got his trust. I, I've earned his trust. I've got, you know, we've got a two-way situation here. So when I'm going out to perform in training, automatically you're getting another 10%, 20% and in games out of them because they've got, it's a way they, they've got that, that, that they haven't got that fear yeah. Of you know, and I think that's what the best coaches do, and, and Graham Potter is very good at that as well. He, he takes the fear out of the environment, 
And you worked with Graham in Ostersunds, didn't you? Which is, is fascinating because Graham was a professional player in the Premier League, but had taken this academic route focused on human intelligence and, and empathy and things like that. How, what, what was that experience like? Was it in deepest, darkest Sweden, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was. I only worked with him very briefly because of the changeover, but um, I think I think what what he created there was phenomenal. Um, along with sort of the previous owner, because what it was definitely what they called it was this no blame culture, mm. and and it was players taking responsibility for their own action. Um, so he gave a lot of responsibility to the players. But also, he didn't. He didn't want to. You know, he didn't want to have everyone blaming each other in terms of was it the results, is it injuries, the referees, you know, because that that can create sort of a negative vibe within the squad. So he said, look, we have to accept that these decisions and injuries and everything else around it's going to be part of our makeup. It's part of the game. So we can't blame each other for this because this is beyond not being in within our control. So, but what we are going to do is we're going to give you the freedom to go out and express and play and mm. do what you do what you're talented at and that is play football. We give you the tools and the framework and the structure and the formation to do that. But when you cross that white line, you know, we want you to to have that freedom where you, you can be who you are. So the human side to him, the human side to his coaching again is, you know, was, was excellent. And again, it's about getting to I think it's getting to know players, people you know, getting to know them, you know, their backgrounds, maybe their families, you know, getting to know them if they come from a different country, different cultures, you know, any sort of religious connotations mm. or beliefs. If you understand all this, it's like if someone new done their homework on you, or maybe you think, wow, you know, they've, they've taken a good interest in me here. They've yeah. already done their homework. I quite like this. And again, it's just simple things like that, you know, that can give you, give players that, that real confidence and belief. And even if they're not playing, they still want to be working hard for you because they know that, you know, that coach has taken the time to get to know me. He's here. He's going to develop me. I might not play this game, but I can play the next game. You know, it's not, it's, it's not a negative environment that there really is potential. Here. So are there general takeaways that you've learned from the, the past couple of decades in terms of maximizing players' performance and happiness? Or is it, is it going down to that individual level that you think is always key? Because that can be tough for managers because of the, the time pressures involved, can't it, to get to know everyone in a 30-man squad? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If you're going to generate one-to-ones, then, you know, that's, that's not all done. That's, that's good. Maybe that might take over a course of a season. You know, mm. it could take that length of time. But I think it, what it can do is create, um, say so for managers, say, for example, got a chance to see maybe one or two players each week on that individual basis. And I think what it does, it creates that positive vibe within the, within the dress because everyone's waiting for it. Well, it's, it's going to be my turn soon. And, I've, and I think the day and age of where players are, you know, they get, they do their job, they go home with the social media and mental health awareness now and everything around it. They want to talk more. They want to be more open. They want to, you know, express themselves that they want to come in and feel part of something rather than come in and do my job, go home. Yeah. And I think, I think the modern day coaches um, really appreciate that type because they will get to know their players more over the course of time. And you can get to know players more by doing sort of more sort of like team bonding stuff, individual work. And it becomes, and it becomes again, just treating them like people. Yes. They're footballers. You're, you're, mm. you're putting them in a competitive environment. You know, it's going to be challenging. You're here to win. There's pressures around that. You know all that. That's a given. That's why you're here. But also also keeping them grounded in a way that, you know, there is, you have got life outside of football. So when you go home, try and maintain your values as much as you can with your family, with your friends, mm. with, you know, your, your partner, your wife, your loved ones. So, and again, if, you've, if players know that they've got that to go home to and then they're coming into this and they've got that mix, it definitely it definitely contributes to a you know to a more happier dressing room. Yeah, and a better performance as well. It's about marginal gains, but it feels like if you get people psychologically right and comfortable, then it's probably going to be a, a uh, absolutely. Max, ma- maximal maximal gain as well. David, uh, I know time's almost almost beat us, but I just wanted to ask you what, what what's next for you? Because I know you've been at Huddersfield. Do you feel you're, you're going to crystallise a role in in football as a, a psychologist? Is that where you want want to go, or is it still the sort of generic coaching? Yeah, I think at the moment because because my background has been quite sort of mixed. It's it's gone from coaching into recruitment, sort of sporting director type roles, and um, I still think for for myself it'd still be um, sort of first team sort of management coaching. 
yeah. for me because where I can maximize those sort of psychology skills as well with the players and staff and people around me and hopefully have a not just an impact on their performance but an impact on their lives I think you know having that understanding especially working all the levels I've worked at can really sort of help players take the sort of those next steps in their career well, it's a brilliant story, a brilliant career. And I think it's fascinating. And the insight you're given both for people in sport and beyond it, I think, in terms of the importance of psychology is is great in, in the context of performance where we used to have that kind of like sergeant major approach sometimes that probably didn't yield the best best results in all walks of life from our bosses. Um, how can we follow you? Is there, is there ways that people, is LinkedIn the best place to keep in touch with, with what you're up to? Yeah, so LinkedIn, um, I'm not big. Uh, I, so I don't have Instagram or Facebook, so keep, I try and keep that sort of, Sure. Pretty private, but but LinkedIn and Twitter, um, yeah, I, I I sort of, you know, put if, if any positive stuff that's out there, I sort of tend to post on there as well. So yeah, that's a that's probably a good way. David, thank you for your time and, and good luck in the near future. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me.